At this time, we'd like to bring Joe Lawrence back uh, for his afternoon presentation. And uh, I think we did have a few questions that we didn't get through from earlier. Um, and we'll, we'll try to get those all entertained and everything addressed here uh, in this part, part with uh, Joe. Yeah, it's up. However, whatever order we want to go in is fine with me. I don't know. Um, well, there was a couple questions that had come in uh, at the end of your your first talk, and then a, a couple more that had come in that they would like to send you away. Do you want to? You want to? If, if it's all right with you, we can start with them because they might tie in. To that's what I was wondering. Uh, so let me ask the 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 the, fir the the two that came in at the end of the first one. Uh, so the, the first one was, did the ratio 80 alfalfa and 20 grass change? <laughs> I'll, I'll, be I'll, I'll uh, hold off on that one because I'll be addressing <laughs> that here. Okay. And here's a more technical question from uh, out in New Brunswick. And I'm just going to read it as is because I'm not a subject matter expert. But will the same yield difference occur in, rel in lower relative maturity corn, 70 Four to 79 still be 0.5 <laughs> metric tons per acre difference? Let me, uh, did, does that make sense what I just said to you? Yeah, I, okay. I think so. So, so that the, the study I referred to um, in New York went from, you know, on, in our relative maturities from us, uh, I believe, an 85 day up to about 110 day. And across that range, they found about a half a ton, a uh, U.S. ton, per five days. Uh, getting down into the into the 70, uh, mid 70 day ranges, we don't have a lot of data on that. My own experience with other trials we've done is, and I think I said this before, is those shorter season hybrids um, really have uh, quite a bit of potential maybe compared to 20 or 30 years ago. And I think uh, there was a time where we uh, saw more of a sacrifice with those shorter season ones, but we've, we've seen to close the gap on that. Um, this is a forage meeting, but I would say the same thing about soybeans. Um, we're growing a lot more shorter group soybeans in New York that um, just with tremendous yield potentials and, and you don't have to worry so much about the dry down at the end. So I think the plant breeding side gets a lot of credit there for bringing along our shorter season uh, crops to uh, have a better potential. Okay, and these these came in uh, since then, but I, they, they, I think they apply to more of your first talk than the, than the second. So can I just rip through them? Okay. Uh, are, are there studies that you're aware of regarding single or dual or split end application on corn silage, corn silage digestibility? So, so I'm not aware of any studies that have looked specifically like at that. It's actually something I'm interested in in reference to the plant stress side of it. So again, I think going forward, some stuff we're going to be looking at is, is stuff like fertilization timing and, and nutrient applications and, and uh, reducing plant stress in the growing season and how that may have a positive impact, impact on fiber. But I'm not aware of anything right now that puts numbers to that. Okay. Uh, that, that question was from our uh, friends up in Werner, and this one is as well. Uh, what is the most effective way to control smooth bed straw in a legumes and grass hay field? Is there a way to kill it without affecting legumes? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, I mean, we do have some different licensed chemicals, uh, differences between the states and Canada, but I'm not aware of any anything that would take out the bed straw. And not, I mean, and not the legumes. And from a chemical standpoint, I think it comes back to management. Um, you know, anything we can do to favor the desirable species we want there. So our pH for alfalfa, that cutting schedule, that last cutting in the fall of the year that was mentioned earlier, um, all of that stuff is going to favor our uh, the, the crop species we actually want over, over the uh, weeds. Um, but from a chemical standpoint, I'm not aware of anything. Okay, well, thank you. And just the one more question. and. Uh, 
Uh, is non-crimped hay only good for haylage, or can that work for doing baleage, or is baleage better off being crimped? No, uh, so any fermented feeds, anything we're putting up at a higher moisture content for fermentation, whether it's uh, chopped haylage or baleage, we have good success with uh, with the not crimping. It's only only for if you really if you want to get to the dry hay standpoint where you need the crimping. Okay, that's all we had from online. I suppose if there's any questions in the room here uh, that pertain to last, uh, otherwise I think you can pretty much go ahead. There was one over here. I don't know if the mic's there. Stick your hand up really high so I can see you. There we go. Everyone's shy and I can't find you very fast. Do you have any experience with using plant growth regulators or anything like that, foliar on alfalfas um, to influence plant physiology or anything like that? No, I don't have anything to okay. offer you there. Sorry. Um, there were also a couple of things I was talking to Christine about over lunch um, that we'll get into a little bit here. But um, so uh, the question came up about what about that? Uh, stand count in alfalfa for deciding to keep the stand or not, if it's a mixed stand. Um, we haven't actually put any numbers to that to say like you only need this many stems per square foot instead of a higher number if it's a pure stand. <coughs> in general though, the way we handle that has been just to say usually in a good mixed stand we're going to be on the lower end of those um, numbers she showed or even below them. And at that point, it's for us, it's a visual assessment of what out, what's what's in the spots where alfalfa is not. Um, is it a desire? Is it the grass? Is it a des desirable species, or is it a weed? And al and also, how much bare ground? So we haven't put any numbers to it other than just to say, all right, we're going to be on the low end with our alfalfa stand counts. But if we if we just use our a little bit of observation and say. Where the alfalfa is not, we have uh, uh, you know a lot of desirable grass species there. Then then we're not so worried about that alfalfa stand count. But if we're if we're seeing bare spots or a lot of dandelions or something else, then then that we treat that like essentially bare ground, right? So um, another uh, couple other notes, and we'll get into them. But um, uh, so wheel traffic, um, I don't know this off the top of my head, but I uh, took the opportunity to look it up quickly when uh, Christine was getting the questions. Um, so some work out of Wisconsin. Um, so they, they documented a 6% uh, loss in the uh, next cutting for every day um, after harvest you were trafficking the field. And so, the, uh, like, they had numbers of two days after harvest, if you traffic the field and in the wheel tracks, there was a 12% yield lost in the next cutting. If you waited five days after mowing to be trafficking that field, they had a 30% yield loss in the in the tr tracks. But that was only for that cut, the next cutting. It wasn't. It didn't necessarily speak to Christine's question, which was, does it affect overwintering? Um, but certainly that um, that extra stress on the field and the stress on the crown of the plant later in the season is um, if your next cutting is is uh, the next spring, right? <laughs> um, then you can think of it that way and not just between cuttings within the same season. I also I thought uh, um, a producer uh, had some great points there. And one thing uh, that's not so much the focus of what we're talking about today, but we've been talking a lot more about storage flexibility. And you know, I think he, he mentioned upright silos, baleage, and ag bags, right? And uh, run into a lot of places where they're, they got one forage uh, storage system, and it really can be a bottleneck for the reasons he referenced. And I think. Um, you know there is some equipment cost to, or or custom. You know maybe you're renting a bagger or something if you don't have it. So there's there's some cost to that flexibility. But I think uh, you know what he mentioned there is is huge and having different storage types and having the ability to carry over those feeds was a was a, a real big point. And on you know for that size farm to have three different options of how they're storing their forages is great. Um, so now we'll jump into the alfalfa grass. 
Um, so I know there's still already a fair amount of it grown um, in various parts of Ontario, <clears throat> and we grow a lot of it in New York. Um, I always joke that, you know, if you go to Wisconsin, they look at you funny if you talk about putting uh, um, grass purposely in an alfalfa stand because it's a it's just a weed to alfalfa right but we do it on purpose and and uh, for a lot of time for a, for a long time part of it was just uh, practicality right we have we can we can have fields with with five or more soil types in the same field and and we can have um, uh, scenarios where putting the grass in is just to fill in the, the spots of the field where the alfalfa won't survive. But more recently, um, there's been a lot more data that really shows the merits of grass. Even if you have what I consider alfalfa ground, that'll support a pure stand. I'll show you some data today of, uh, <coughs> of some of the benefits of having some grass in that, in that stand. So I think as I go through this, we'll be thinking about these two different reasons why we might do this. Is it variable soil drainage, or do we have alfalfa ground, but there's some other benefits to put in grass in there? And uh, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Jerry Cherney, our extension forage specialist at Cornell. A lot of the data and the, some of the slides are stuff he shared with me. Uh, um, you know, he's a mentor of mine, and uh, now I, can, I have the privilege of having him as a colleague. And uh, um, he's been doing a lot of work on alfalfa grass for a lot of years before it was, uh, before other people were even thinking about it. So, um, and, and a lot of this information comes from his research program. So a survey done um, speaking about um, alfalfa acres purposely mixed with grass. Survey done in New York found that over 85% of our acres are uh, planted with a grass. And a lot of other areas of the country, it's less than 10% of our acres. Again, getting back to our glacial till soils, the soil type variabilities we have, the winter conditions that we can, we can have. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I was over lunch. I was speaking to someone who mentioned in eastern Ontario and in the River Valley, which I was on the south uh, side of the River Valley. We don't have a lot of snow cover in the winter, right? If we did get snow at home, by the next day it was all blown into the hedgerows and the and the uh, field was bare again with the wind off the lake and river, right? So we have those sort of um, scenarios too that affect us. Um, so why do we do this? I mentioned suboptimal soil drainage. We have a comfort level. We have nutritionists that are, are used to this. Um, and that can be really important. Do, your, do uh, yourself on the farm and your farm advisors buy into the benefits of this and, and want to work with you because it can change your feeding program. And so is it changing it? Are they willing to do that? Or are they scared of... Uh, something other than pure alfalfa. Um, so we, you know, I mentioned we have a lot of work out of Cornell and now some other states, uh, even Wisconsin's getting in on it to look at uh, these mixtures. So we have the research to support it. Um, and we've had some improvements in both the alfalfa and some in grasses that we'll touch on some more. <laughs> so, um, you know, we actually see uh, we can improve overall yields by mixing some some grass in versus pure alfalfa. We can have a higher NDF digestibility, and we can, uh, with proper harvest management, we can maintain a similar protein content. Uh, some research out of New York over the last couple of years from Dr. Cherney, he found when he compared a 30% grass mix versus pure alfalfa over the course of the season um, across all, uh, a number of trials we were picking up a third to two-thirds ton per acre of dry matter per season by having the grass in the mix over the pure stand. We could pick up six to seven points of uh, NDFD and um, we could keep um, similar protein levels. And that was with 30 percent. Um, so we'll get into the percentages a little more and that question was raised already. Uh, what's the cow's perspective? There's definitely some advantages. Higher fiber digestibility can increase intake and milk production. We get we can get more forage in the diet. Um, potentially uh, 
higher, uh, um, some better quality characteristics in the diet that can have overall uh, positive impacts on animal health. So how does the grass you pick make a difference? Does, it, does the timing match up with alfalfa? You know, we think orchard grass, right? Heads out really early in the spring. Uh, you mix that with alfalfa and it's nearly impossible to, to uh, get the timing right on both crops. How aggressive is the grass? Do you want to maintain it at a lower portion of your stand or is it going to take off and take over the stand? Um, over the years, we've had a lot of alfalfa reed canary grass acres. And reed canary grass tends to be really slow to establish in the first few years. And then once it gets established, it really can take over. Um, so after, you know, as time goes on, you, you end up with a heavy grass stand with a little bit of alfalfa. And what percent in the stand do we really want? And we'll get into that. So thinking about our grasses, um, Dr. Cherney's put together some list. Uh, so what, you know, tolerates wet soils. Um, you know, we're ranked from top to bottom. Our reeds, canary, and our fescues tolerate the wet soils the best. Um, and uh, then we get down into the Timothy's orchard grass. You know, we've had a lot of issues, especially in the St. Lawrence River Valley, regarding orchard grass that also came up in Christine's talk. And part of it has been ice sheeting. We get back to those... Uh, those temperature, the calendars she showed with the temperatures. And you know, one thing we've had is rapid snow melts and then the next day it turns cold again and there's ponding on the fields and, and ice sheeting suffocating out. We've had some real disasters with orchard grass with related to that, uh, that ice sheeting and uh, suffocation. All right, how about ease of establishment? Timothy, definitely easier to establish. Then we get down, the fescues are in the middle. And, uh, you know, I already mentioned this, but reed canary grass tends to be slow to establish, but once it's there, it really sticks around. <clears throat> Regrowth potential, um, you know, from cutting to cutting and thinking about how that matches up with alfalfa. Uh, the, you know, fescues, that's one place where orchard grass is pretty aggressive, right? Um, is with regrowth. So um, thinking about how that matches up with our alfalfa crop. Um, you know, potassium content, obviously potassium content is going to be influenced by fertilization because we know the plants will luxury consume potassium if there's extra there. But there are some, uh, there are some uh, uh, differences, um, species differences related to, uh, to the tendency to luxury consume potassium if we're thinking about dry cow hay. <laughs> All right, crude protein, um, highest to lowest, uh, tends to go in this order. Again, assuming harvest timing, right? Because we know with all our grasses, crude protein um, content can really plummet if we get out later in the season. But in general, assuming harvest timing is equal, um, this tends to be the trend with our grasses. I showed this slide earlier. Uh, in the last talk about the, for, the potential forage quality. Uh, there's been a lot of work done with meadow fescue in the last few years and it uh, shows uh, quite a bit of promise. Um, so we kind of went, we kind of went uh, in a lot of New York from reeds canary grass being the grass of choice with alfalfa and then uh, tall fescue gained popularity. Um, and uh, for two reasons, one, the data looked good on it, and two, the price of reed canary grass seed went through the roof. I don't remember if it was, you know, seven, eight years ago, it was like $8 a pound in the U.S. for reed canary grass seed. And so you combine that with some positive data on tall fescue, that was $2 a pound at the time. And a lot of farmers uh, were willing to make the switch to try it. And some of them went back to reed's canary when uh, the price came down, but a lot of them really liked the fescue mixed with the alfalfa and stuck with it. And now the meadow fescue is uh, more popular. Uh, after the last talk, I had a question about, well, you didn't mention rye grasses at all. Um, we have such uh, challenges with them overwintering in New York that we really, 
Um, other, there, you know, we'll see them in pasture mixes, mixes but for, uh, for mechanically harvested hay fields, we really don't do much work with them because the winter survival is just so unpredictable. But from a quality standpoint, they're absolutely, they got really high quality, right? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. It's just a comment, a question came in that's right in tune with what you're saying. Uh, what about uh, metal brome grass mixed with alfalfa? Um, so metal brome grass is supposed to be a, tolerate cuttings a little bit better than smooth brome. Um, but part of our challenge with mixing brome grass, as a lot of you probably know, is it can be a nice quality grass if you're only cutting it two or three times a year, but it doesn't tolerate a, a really aggressive cutting schedule like we tend to see with our alfalfa. From, I, don't, I don't have a lot of experience with metal brome, but from the little bit of data I've seen, it can potentially uh, tolerate a four-cut system better than smooth brome can. So in that case, if you're on a four-cut system with your alfalfa, you it might be worth considering, um, but I don't have a lot of data on it. But that's that's been one of the challenges with brome in general and matching it up with alfalfa is it just, if you try to cut it too aggressively, it just disappears. So how about alfalfa variety selection? Potato leaf hoppers already come up a couple of times today. So we have resistant varieties, you know, that definitely factors in. You know, we do have some branch-rooted alfalfas that are hopefully tolerate that variable soil drainage a little bit better, right? Um, we have hybrid alfalfa. Um, now we have some high quality, both genetically engineered and naturally bred to be higher quality. And, and then, you know, the reduced lignin, the, the genetically engineered side. How about that? So. You know, there's uh, many versions of Harv Extra on the market from different companies. Um, and uh, it's consistently 10 to 20% lower in lignin. Um, however, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the lignin, drop in lignin content and uh, the, the increase in fiber digestibility. That plant still got to stand up, right? And that came, that question came up earlier. And we know in forages there's some cross-linking uh, um, that goes on in the plant that can affect fiber digestibility in, t in, in addition to lignin content. That's why we can't just use lignin content alone as a predictor of digestibility. So I think part of that with the, well, we, you know, we can genetically modify these to really drop the lignin content, but that doesn't, that's not the only thing that's affecting the digestibility of the fiber in the plant. Um, and then, you know, what is the seed cost and what's the market, mar market acceptance of that crop for, depending on if you're a hay grower or in a dairy situation. Um, we have seen, we'll talk about, uh, you know, Another thing is we, uh, if we're doing an alfalfa grass mix, is uh, and we we grow the like something like Harv Extra, it's Roundup Ready. So obviously you can't seed the grass in there if you want to use the Roundup Ready technology. There's nothing that says you have to use it, right? Just because it's in the plant doesn't mean you have to use the technology. But we get that question, and we have had some growers in New York that have successfully seeded Roundup Ready alfalfa. Um, went in and cleaned up the weeds and then went back in August and uh, interseeded grass and had a, a relatively good stand um, the next year. But it, it's so it's an option, but I'm not saying it's something you have to do. Um, so what are the challenges to the dairy farm uh, for growing mixes? Forage, the consistency of the forage quality, and we'll get into that more. And what has the greatest impact on that consistency. So the percent, if we're targeting, uh, you know, so I showed you before the 30% the, uh, 30 grass versus uh, pure alfalfa and some of the benefits to yield and quality. Well, how do we get and keep 30% grass in the stand? Those of you that grow alfalfa grass knows that it varies, right? Um, so what affects that? Uh, Dr. Cherney, I, I, I like these, uh, um, graphs that he put together. So what in your stand favors alfalfa and what favors grass? Certainly the alfalfa is favored by a higher pH, better drainage. 
um, the grass species. So if you have a less aggressive grass like Timothy, you can keep, you can put it in the stand and it'll probably only be 10 or 20 percent of your stand, right? You put orchard grass in there and after a few years it could be 70 percent of the stand, right? Um, the seeding rate, obviously if you put more seed down for grass, uh, then you get a, a higher grass content. Soil compaction, um, spring seeding date, uh, earlier spring seeding dates tend to favor the grass. Um, and then on the flip side, if we're doing like an August seeding, uh, it's the uh, opposite. Uh, some more factors, manure application. If we're putting any source of nitrogen down, we're going to favor the grasses. Um, and generally, uh, our potassium is going to favor the alfalfa more. Newer stands are going to tend to have more alfalfa. Cuts per season. The, if we, the more aggressively we cut it, um, the more we're favoring the grass in the stand. Stubble height, we have already talked quite a bit about that today. Um, that is a management tool. If you're getting too much grass in a mixed stand, and assuming the alfalfa that's there is still healthy, cut a, you can cut a little lower, and in the next, it will bring the alfalfa back and give it a regrowth advantage over the grass. Um, and then the number one thing in a whole bunch of seeding rate trials we found in New York is the moisture one month after planting. You get lots of moisture in the first month after planting, you're going to have lots of grass. You have dry conditions after planting, regardless of how many pounds of grass you put out there in the mix, you're going to have uh, more alfalfa in that stand. So what about that percentage? What's the effect of grass percent in a mixed stand on, on crude protein? Well, as we would expect, as we get higher percent grass in the stand, um, we can have a, a larger impact on crude protein. And we, we also looked at it by fertility of the soil. So if you have very high fertility soil environment, um, it was only about a, um, you know, less than a percent unit drop in, in uh, crude protein um, with every 10 percent unit increase in grass. But if you have a, a, if you get down a high fertility environment or an average fertility environment, you're going to see more of a drop as you increase grass percentage. On the alfalfa side, if uh, uh, we spoke a little bit about this earlier, if we assume a 1% unit change in NDF digestibility is significant to the cow in terms of milk production, um, you know, studies we've done, you know, show that uh, what are we doing as we increase grass content? We're kind of diluting out. If we're going to mix grass with like a low lignin alfalfa, uh, we kind of dilute out the benefit of the low lignin alfalfa as we go to higher grass content, right? Um, I guess, you know, this is kind of intuitive, but, but this is actually research numbers put, put to what we probably figure is uh, happening anyways, right? And we hit that 1% unit difference in mixtures between a uh, Harv Extra and, and uh, other alfalfas at about 60% grass in the um, stand. So in other words, um, probably if we're more than 60% grass in the stand, it doesn't matter. But if we're less than 60% grass, then our low lignin alfalfas can still have an advantage. How about the grass side of it? I mentioned meadow fescue having uh, an advantage. Now we, you know, we look at that compared to other grass uh, species and we see that um, we see the opposite, right? Because we have better digestibility in the meadow fescue, so as we um, increase that in the mixture, um, we see more benefit. Uh, and we hit that one, if that one percentage unit difference is meaningful, we hit that way down here with just, uh, you know, uh, 15, 20 percent uh, fescue in the stand. So what does all that mean to us? Um, based on the percent grass in the stand, well, if we have um, less than 60% grass in the stand, uh, picking a, a conventional alfalfa versus a low lignin alfalfa can make a difference. But if we don't, if we have more than 60% grass, it really doesn't matter what alfalfa you use. Um, on the flip side, uh, as little as 15% grass that meadow fescue can make a difference over other grass uh, species in terms of 
um, in terms of its uh, benefit to that fiber digestibility of the whole stand. And actually, as little as 5% of any grass can have uh, um, increase the digestibility of NDF by one percentage unit. So, you know, our speaker uh, before this mentioned he tries for like a 90 10. Um, so even that 10% grass is giving him a little bump in fiber digestibility over a pure stand. <laughs> so uh, harvest timing, we know that harvest timing is a, an issue and we looked earlier at, uh, before lunch at harvest timing and um, of pure grass or pure alfalfa, right? Well what happens if you take like, and we talked about being able to delay the uh, harvest timing of a reduced lignin alfalfa. What happens if we um, uh, have it in a mixed stand? Oops, what happened here? Oh, sorry, that, the slides got, are out of order a little bit. All right, <laughs> hold that thought for a second. Um, so this is just putting the last uh, three slides all into one. So there's our uh, um, fiber digestibility in a mixed stand with uh, just kind of an average alfalfa and an average grass. Here's our, alfalf our uh, fiber digestibility in a mixed stand based on grass content if we add in a uh, low lignin alfalfa and still just have an average grass. The, now we have the red line is a average, just a average conventional alfalfa, but we use meadow fescue instead. And what do we notice? Those lines cross at about 30%, right? So at 30% grass in the mix, either having um, uh, choosing meadow fescue with a conventional alfalfa can have just as much impact on fiber digestibility as choosing uh, um, reduced lignin. And I don't want to pick on uh, you know seed costs, but we can. Uh, <laughs> Right? Um, if we can get that same benefit out of 30% fescue in our stand, that's a lot lower seed cost than, uh, than our reduced lignin alfalfas, right? And then if we do add in both, if we do add in uh, a low lignin alfalfa with a meadow fescue, then um, we can see uh, quite an improvement across percentages of grass in the stand on fiber digestibility. So what's the downside? Well, we, I already mentioned it a little bit, but how do you, how the heck do you get and keep the 20 to 30 percent grass in the stand, right? And we mentioned some of that. Well, we've actually dropped our seeding rates in New York down to a pound to a, uh, two pounds of acre of meadow fescue with an alfalfa, and uh, we're we're uh, getting generally getting that uh, um, 20 to 30 percent grass even at those low seeding rates. Now the slides I mentioned before, like moisture um, in one month after seeding and some of those other factors pl definitely play a role in, um, in uh, that percentage. But we're finding with this sort of ratio in our seed mixes, we're, we're hitting that target often. So what about keeping that? Some data from a plot we had um, in, in the northern part of, of New York, and this was spring seeded in 2016. And um, this is going through the gray bars are the percent grass in the second cutting in, of the seeding year. The blue bars are first cutting of the first production year after seeding, and the uh, orange bars are th the third cutting of the first production year. Look at the differences in percent grass in the stand and how, how much they changed and how uh, rapidly they uh, went to favor uh, the grass in the stand. So what happened in that time period? Well, that winter of 2016-17, we had numerous freeze-thaw cycles, just like we heard about this morning, that were really hard on the alfalfa. Um, and uh, so we we went from the fall of uh, you know the fall of 2016, the fall of the seeding year, with with 15 to 30 percent grass in the stand, to when that stand woke up the next spring, some of that alfalfa was already gone, and we had we had up you know upwards of 70 percent grass in that first cutting. 
We also had a summer between that first and third cutting with excess precipitation and a real bad potato leaf hopper outbreak in this, uh, in this uh, research trial. And so we, we saw those factors uh, further favor the grass over, over the alfalfa in that um, situation. So we, this can be a challenge, you know, the, the concept of getting 20 to 30% uh, grass in the stand and the reality of it can be really different, but we do know it's a, a good place to target. Um, so how about the economics? If we assume that that 1% change in NDFD is a half a pound of milk per cow per day, um, then it's actually a pretty direct relationship if you, if you uh, uh, do the math based on the data that we saw um, that we have from New York, and this is a slide from Dr. Cherney. And the other thing is it's, um, it's pretty much size neutral. It's not, it's not something that's going to benefit a, a smaller or larger farm more or less. Regardless of how many cows you're milking, this improvement in digestibility. And what are we always doing with economics? We're always, we always make a whole bunch of assumptions and then make a calculation, right? So this is all based on research that's been done in the past suggesting that that 1% change in, uh, in fiber digestibility can have that half a pound. Uh, change on milk, but we have to acknowledge that it's based on those assumptions. So, kind of uh, thinking about some of the pros and cons. Um, you know, on the pros side, there's a you know a, a pretty good list, I think, um, both on the agronomic side and the uh, animal health and milk production side. The cons: we have that variable forage quality, limited weed uh, control. And what do we do? I, you know, Roundup Ready Alfalfa is it really a con? But it's if you want to use that technology, how do you use it with a with an alfalfa grass mix? Um, so now jumping over to some other considerations for this, um, and we, you know, that so that part of it was kind of that was making the case for why grass can be a benefit even if you have that good alfalfa ground, right? Um, now, what if we don't? What if we have that variable drain ground? And what are some of our other management considerations? So do you have uh, premium quality alfalfa land? Do you have alfalfa snout beetle? I know um, this far west it's not an issue, but I mentioned this morning, I, I know it is a little bit in eastern Ontario, and it's definitely an issue for us in New York. Um, but so if you have a pest that's uh, going to be known to be hard on your alfalfa, then having grass in the stand can be a management tool too, right? Um, can you segregate your forages by quality? Do you have one bunk silo on the farm that everything goes into and you can't separate it out to feed different groups of animals? Or like our last uh, speaker, are you able to, you know, use some silos and uh, ag bags and um, Baleage or, what, or a bunk silo to separate out by quality and be able to target that feed to different groups of animals. Um, I already mentioned this. Do you have a nutritionist that believes in alfalfa grass and is willing to help you manage it? And, uh, and are you willing to invest more into your management time to get the positive outcomes that, that uh, the potential is there for? So if we think about this, this is kind of a generic, uh, you know, a generic uh, little uh, picture. But you know, our, um, in general, we start with our grasses, we move in our, into our mixed stands, and we, and our, as we saw with some of the uh, slides earlier, the legumes tend to be a little more forgiving in harvest timing. <clears throat> we saw this slide earlier as well, just backing that up. You know, what happens with crude protein as we go through um, same, you know, these differences. So total fiber increases at about the same rate, but we see the scale is different, right, for alfalfa and grass. Fiber digestibility decreases at a similar um, rate, but again, uh, we're starting out at a different point. Okay, so this is the slide I thought I was at earlier. So if we have, uh, if we have if we're going to mix grass with a low lignin alfalfa and we're thinking about that strategy of, of delaying harvest to get the same quality, 
what happens when we have grass in the mix? Well, this is plotting the days that uh, you can delay harvest of a stand with low lignin based on the percent grass in the mix. And we see that with 10% grass, we can still delay harvest five days. Uh, if we get up to 30% grass, we're at more like four days. And if we get up closer to 50% grass, we can only delay that harvest by about two days and still maintain that quality. So when do we start harvesting a, a mixed stand? Um, this is in inches, uh, but um, you know you can go to uh, uh, stuff with pure uh, alfalfa stands and get um, information like there's a peak stick and some you know there's been some different stuff done over the years on alfalfa heights and harvest timing. Well, Dr. Cherney actually did some work and actually found out that even in mixed stands, the alfalfa height still serves as a really good predictor of harvest timing. Um, grass heights, not so much, because we all know the, the morphology of the grass and the way it grows can really vary, right? So grass height doesn't work real well for us, but alfalfa height can. And we have this card that we, uh, we actually made a bunch of like pocket cards out of it um, that, that we pass out at meetings and stuff that just has um, alfalfa height and percent grass. And as you increase your percent grass, your optimum timing for first cutting is going to be at a lower alfalfa height. So if we look at this, if we have a pure alfalfa stand, we're in that 30 to 32 inch range for the height of the alfalfa. If we get up to 40% grass in the stand, now we should be targeting a 26 inch height of our alfalfa. Um, so if we're out there looking in the spring and taking some measurements, if, you know, if we get closer to that, um, if we're closer to like a 50-50 mix, we better be thinking about cutting it when the alfalfa is about you know, 24, 26 inches tall. And this has worked quite well for us in, in keeping track of harvest timing for our first cutting. Um, it, we only use it for first cutting because then for the rest remainder of the cuttings, we just go by number of days. Um, but, but because first cutting can be so variable depending on the spring weather we get. It's, it's worked well. Um, this is just an example from St. Lawrence County in northern New York of uh, uh, a whole bunch of the extension, uh, county extension there went out and measured fields actually across multiple counties in the northern part of the state. And this is that same graph. And all those dots are the heights of uh, um, different stands that they randomly measured around the region. And this was May 16th. Um, it was this slides from a couple years ago. It wasn't 28 or 2019 data, but we see that uh, by May 16th, our pure our um, pure grass stands are pretty much ready to cut, right? But um, everything else is still well below the line. Um, but this is a, a program that we use across New York, and that our extension offices get involved in and going out and measuring some fields in their neighborhood. And they send out an email once a week to all the farms that they have email uh, addresses for, just giving them a, a report like this uh, once a week is kind of an early warning system of when they should be getting out and measuring their own fields. So the, another challenge is estimating the actual percent alfalfa grass in a stand, right? Um, and we tend to uh, we tend to oftentimes overestimate grass um, when we visually look at it. So there's a couple of things. It definitely requires more than a windshield survey. It requires getting out there and looking at your field and calibrating yourself to it. Um, Dr. Cherney's been doing some work with a cell phone app that uh, you can actually go out and take pictures of the stand. And based on uh, alfalfa grass, it'll give you a prediction of uh, it's not it's not uh, it's not on the he hasn't released it yet. We've we've been beta testing it in New York, um, but again, it requires more than one picture, right? It doesn't it doesn't require getting out of the driveway and snapping one picture at the edge of the field. It requires just like scouting or something, right? Do a W-shaped pattern through the field and take a bunch of pictures. And the way it's set up is it's cumulative. So if you walk through and take 10 pictures, it keeps a running average 
of the of those. Um, so it's something coming down the line. It's not quite available yet, but it could be useful in getting those predictions. Uh, um, Cornell worked with the Dairy One Forage Lab in uh, New York to actually develop an NIR equation. Um, so you send in a forage, uh, a mixed uh, grass legume forage sample to the lab, and they'll actually give you on your report a percent grass. Um, I'm not promoting uh, necessarily Dairy One, but it's just right now it's the only lab I'm aware of that's doing this. I, w I would like to see other labs uh, pick it up and give it a try because I think it would be interesting. The one thing is it, it's kind of a post-mortem assessment, right? It's sending in, it's sending in your forage after harvest to uh, tell you what was out there before. So it's not necessarily helpful in harvest timing for that cutting. But it is helpful for calibrating your own eyes to what the stand is. So if you have, um, you know, what I like to do is look at a stand. I write down what my estimate is visually. And then at harvest, take a, a sample from that field and send it to the lab and see how close uh, my eyes were to what the lab's telling me. <laughs> um, so these are some pictures from Dr. Cherney. I don't know how well this is showing up on the on the screen, but um, you know, so visually to me, there's not a whole lot of difference in these pictures. I don't know if you guys can see it well enough or not, but it's actually a difference between 10 and 25 percent grass in that stand when you actually uh, take we take clippings and separate the alfalfa grass and weigh them. Um, it's actually a 15 percent difference there, so that's why it can be real tricky. With your um, just with your eyes, unless you kind of get calibrated to it. Um, you know, here's a, again a research plot with uh, just showing. You know, these so these are uh, just small strips with different seeding rates, and we see um, we see as we go from here very little grass in the stand to to heavier grass contents. We also did some work with some sparse heading orchard grass versus normal orchard grass, and uh, so those, those pit, that's a side-by-side -side picture in the same field of a strip of each and the, dim, you know, the difference we see in uh, um, timing. <laughs> so we mentioned this already, but how can you store alfalfa grass to impact your feeding program? And so it has impacts both on how do we feed it out? Is it, is it buried in our bunk beside, behind some other forage and we can't get to it? Or can we get to it? The other thing is, especially with baleage, um, I, I mean, I, I tend to like baleage. Uh, there's some benefits to it, especially for certain farm sizes. But what happens with baleage, especially if it's um, on variable drain ground? Every one of those bales could be a different forage, right? Because especially if, if it's good alfalfa ground and you uniformly have 20% grass through the whole stand, then you have a nice mix. But if you have spot, if you have variable drainage and you have one spot where the alfalfa is doing really well and one spot the alfalfa didn't survive and it's all grass, if you put that in some, you know, a bunk silo or something, it kind of gets blended together. If you're doing something like baleage, you could have in the same field from the same cutting one bale that's 80% alfalfa and one bale that's 80% grass, right? And are we going to sample every single one of those bales as we feed them? No. It'd be great if we could, but we're not going to. We're not doing that, right? Um, so, to the extent possible, marking what fields forages came out of, and obviously we have to be practical by how often we can sample. But alfalfa grass is something that we're going to, you know. We would like to sample more frequently to, re, uh, to adjust our feeding programs. <laughs> so um, this is a comment from Dr. Cherney. It's alfalfa grass is really a, the, a rare combination of under where we can increase yield and quality. Oftentimes when we talk about forage quality, stuff we do to increase yield can, can have uh, in negative impacts on quality and vice versa. Stuff we do to increase quality can, 
can have negative impacts on yield. But um, mixing these two together, we, we see that we can get a yield bump and a quality bump when managed properly. It's not easy to manage, but it has uh, payback if you can. Um, you know, we really think that at 20 to 30 percent grass is is really ideal, but it's it's more of a management um, and a mother nature thing of of getting and keeping that um, percentage. Meadow fescue definitely is looking good in our trials as well as some trials in uh, the north central part of the U.S. Um, I know Dr. Cherney had a collaboration with Kentucky, and they grew some. Uh, they did some trials with Kentucky, and it, it did not perform nearly as well um, as it moved further south, and the forage quality was not as good. So uh, there are some regional differences, um, and certainly we, you know, uh, anytime we're thinking about this, regardless of what grass species we're using thinking about choosing later maturing varieties to better match up with our alfalfa is a big consideration. So that's what I had, um, you know, again, thinking about the two sides of it. Are we, are we growing this because we have variable soils and we need something to fill in the spots where the alfalfa won't survive? Or are we growing this because we have really good uniform ground and, and it offers us some potential to uh, to improve our forage program um, on uh, on that better ground, so actually, uh, why don't I go first? Because this uh, question came in from Werner at the tail end when you're answering at the beginning, so might need to rewind a bit, but is there a preference between the flail crimp or the double rolls? Is one better? Um, for, so for, I assume that's a dry hay question. Um, and I, no, I don't, I don't have any personal experience or data to say one that's, is better than the other. I guess I would take the opportunity to make a comment on the, what I hear sometimes on the flail crimpers for silage is that there, um, I often hear the idea that, well, the flail crimpers help us with silage because they kind of knock some of the wax off of the leaves and the stem and they strip it more than the crimper, than the, uh, crimper style does. Um, I still don't, the, uh, my experience is that that still doesn't help. Um, not crimping at all is still going to get you the most rapid dry down for, for silage. Um, and I don't see uh, that. Uh, stripping that waxy layer off with it, and the theory that the flails do that um, has has any benefit but on it from a dry hay standpoint I'm not aware of any um, significant advantage of one over the other yes um, if I may go in here yeah um, I saw you you there, there were a couple of uh, a couple of Forages, uh, a couple of uh, alfalfa varieties you, you did mention in one of the slides there. And I was just wondering if uh, tannin containing alfalfa is not a possibility also? Cons oh, wow. tannin, tannins, oh, considering the benefits right. that tannins have. Then the second question is about uh, the, uh, the NDF digestibility figures or values you did show there. I was just wondering also, how do you get them? Is it just from modeling or they were actually from in vitro tests that were done? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so, uh, so most of that data from Dr. Cherney is wet chemistry um, in his lab of measuring fiber digestibility. I believe some of it was, um, there was some NIR data from a few commercial labs, but he still does a lot of wet chemistry work in his lab when analyzing um, some of the, these samples. So, and most of, most of those. So, one thing I didn't uh, didn't mention there is oftentimes most of the the NDF digestibility stuff that I was showing for hay crops was 48 hour. Um, Values, most of the corn silage work is being done at, on 30 hour um, NDF digestibilities, so difference between corn silage and the hay crops there. Uh, so the first part, so I don't have a lot of experience with the tannins, but I actually have a slide that 
didn't make it into this presentation, um, but it, it's with a quote from an alfalfa breeder with, uh, um, with one of the major companies, is that being the next thing coming down the uh, pike on the genetic engineering side is adjusting, uh, um, so they, you know, they've tackled the lignin part of it, and the next piece of it um, being a, adjusting tannin levels with the idea of influencing the amount of uh, bypass protein in the alfalfa. So, um, so I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I do know that it's something the uh, from the genetic engineering standpoint that the industry is is working on, and um, and that you know is kind of uh, promoting as potentially the next big advancement um, in alfalfa as it relates to forage quality. On? Okay, there we go. Um, just got two questions. One uh, customer of mine who's just grows straight grass for milk cows. Um, he's wondering about uh, including red or white clover in his pure grass stands. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, yeah, I I do have some experience with it. Um, personally, I think I mentioned before too that you know I grew up on heavy clay soil, so we use some clovers there. So. So clover, you know, has a, a, a good quality potential. The uh, biggest difference is, uh, um, I mean, legumes in general tend to be a little harder to dry than grasses, but clovers are definitely harder to dry than alfalfa is. So um, that's, that can be a frustration. And if it's me being mechanically harvested, um, then uh, you know we we generally tend to get better yields out of our red clovers than white. If it's gonna if it's in a grazing scenario, the white clovers could um, you know have some potential. But generally, from a yield standpoint, um, and we do see some red clover uh, uh, grass mixes in New York where alfalfa is just not really an option. Okay. Um, and then the second one is is this is dating back a few years ago. Um, I, I was told that us as a company, as, as Cangro, um, have funded research at Cornell um, for adding different nutrients or, or stimuli into manure tankers. Do you, do you, have, do you know anything about the, that research being done? I know this was like four years ago that yeah. I haven't heard anything yet. No, no, okay. I don't know who that would have been through. I mean, we, you know, we have a big... Uh, nutrient management um, program with um, dairy, but I don't, it's not something, I don't know who, what researcher was working on it. Okay. Yeah, I'd have to find out. So. Um, Joe, I got one here from uh, the folks up in Earlton. Uh, would you recommend uh, creeping red fescue as a mitigating factor for compaction and providing ground cover? Uh, that's a crap I don't have any experience with. Um, Personally, so I don't don't have a good answer there. So. Okay, all right then. Um, folks up in Werner would like to know uh, at what percent of grass do we start to apply the nitrogen? So our general rule of thumb is is uh, is the, a fifty percent cutoff. Um, if it's if it's over 50% alfalfa in the stand, we treat it as an alfalfa crop. If it's over 50% grass, we treat it as a as a grass crop and start um, and start acknowledging that the uh, the nitrogen fixation from the alfalfa isn't going to help our grasses. I do know that you know it's not an official recommendation, but I do do know that some of our crop uh, consultants in New York um, do promote for uh, at spring green up um, a little uh, lower rate of nitrogen even if you have as uh, um, as much as 30 to 40 percent grass in the stand but we don't have any research data to back that up I just know it's a practice that's happening um, around the state again it comes back to are you trying to encourage the alfalfa in the stand or trying to encourage the grass in the stand um, because anytime we add nitrogen we're going to favor favor the grasses. So, if uh, you want more grass in your stand, then um, 
it's an option. If you already have what you feel like is too much grass in the stand, then uh, then uh, I'd stay away from the nitrogen. Thanks. Hello, Joel. Uh, my question would be, when establishing a new stand, what's your favorite practice or what would you recommend? <laughs> So I'm kind of unconventional on this um, because uh, in a, a previous job I had, we did a lot of broadcast seedings of alfalfa grass and it goes a lot against a lot of the university recommendations, but we had tremendous success with it. Um, so I'm, um, I, you know, I personally I have a lot of flexibility in my mind of, uh, as long as we have good seed bed preparation and we, we go back through and, and roll it and get some good seed to soil contact, um, I'm not as picky as some are because I, you know, my personal experience is we've had really good success with different options. The other thing that comes up with alfalfa grasses, especially with our bigger seeded grasses, is how do we get them to mix if we're drilling them? Um, and are they going to separate out? So most of you know if you put a big seeded grass in with alfalfa and, and even if you thoroughly mix it in the hopper and put it in a drill, as you bounce across the field, the alfalfa tends to settle out and seed itself first and the last few passes you do with the drill are pretty much all grass because that's all that's left. It's all floated to the top, right? So, um, so with our big seeded grasses, that's another place where actually Again, it goes against a lot of the recommendations, but some of the broadcast seedings, we get a more uniform distribution um, depending on what percent we're trying to put in the stand. So. Yeah, hello. Um, uh, the first uh, time I we seeded down, we put uh, sulfur with it uh, the first year, and uh, the years afterwards, we should put sulfur too uh, with it, but we put manure, uh, two times manure, uh, 5,000 gallons per time. Do we still have to put sulfur? Uh... Um, yeah, so again, you know, some research we did about 10 years ago in New York, we did not, um, we did not see uh, sulfur, this was in pure alfalfa, but we did not see a, a response, a crop response to sulfur when there was, when dairy manure was applied. Um, in in uh, the rotation, so it wasn't they didn't even have to be an annual um, application. Do you have something to add to that? Am I on? Okay. So um, some work that was done, kind of 2014, 2015, on sulfur on alfalfa in Ontario suggested that sometimes there was a response, and it it was more than 50% of the time. I think five out of seven sites. They tried this on, they saw a yield response and a protein response to adding sulfur. So it does depend a bit where you are in the province. Um, because sul um, alfalfa has one of the highest sulfur demands of any field crop we grow, um, if you're in a canola growing region, if you're applying sulfur to your canola, you should probably be applying it to your alfalfa. Anywhere else, if cereals are responding, alfalfa will too. So that can be a guideline if uh, it's too early in the season for a tissue test. And we did see a response with, with, with fields that didn't have any manure. So we, that's, but it was a, it was almost, it was about as clean cut as you get in research and in our study. And again, that's, that's, uh, you know, a New York based thing, which could vary. But in that scenario, it was pretty much a black and white where we had, um, manure applied. We didn't get a response to sulfur fertilizer where we where there wasn't manure. We did see a response. And livestock manure often has sulfur in it, so that's something to bear in mind when you're trying to figure out whether or not you need sulfur. Is how much was in the manure that went on? Okay. All right, any further questions for Joe there? We thank you, Joe, for coming here to Canada for this and here to Stratford, and that was excellent, excellent talk. We appreciate that a great deal. Give him a round of applause, please. I, I'd just like to say, too, thanks for having me. It's, uh, so I'm kind of doing a loop around the pond here because I came in 
came in from central New York, and because I live in the northern part of the state, I'm going to go back across the top of the lake. But uh, um, but uh, I'm I'm glad I had the opportunity, and uh, my contact information was there. So be happy to hear from anyone in the future. So thank you. Mm -hmm.